All right, so in this video, we're going to look at section A of the 2017 AQA paper one, but we're just looking at the section A in this video. The other sections will follow soon. So we've got a nice type of potassium, uh, 4019, and we use that to, as a way of dating rocks in a similar way to carbon dating. So it decays to produce argon by a process called electron capture, which we can see in this equation with some blanks in it. So we want a complete the equation first of all. So electron capture, a proton turns into a neutron by capturing electron. So the proton number goes down, but the nuclear number stays the same. And to conserve lepton number, we produce an electron neutrino. So explain which fundamental interaction is responsible for the decay in that uh, so this is a form of decay, which means it's the weak interaction. And an up quark is changing into a down quark as the proton captures the electron. OK, so one decay mechanism for the decay of these particles um, results in it having excess energy and it loses the energy by emitting gamma photons. Calculate the wavelength of the photon released by the argon nucleus. So we first need to convert 1.46 mega electron volts into joules. Then we just plug it into our equation to calculate the wavelength. So fairly straightforward. OK, so potassium isotope can also decay by a second process to form calcium-14. Suggest how the emissions from a nucleus of decaying potassium can be used to confirm which decay process is occurring. So uh, the decay process that we've got for producing calcium is clearly beta minus because the proton number is increasing but the nuclear number is constant so like this would be what i think the equation would be for turning uh the potassium isotope into the calcium one so if the, we can put this in a cloud chamber um we can see essentially that the particles produced will deflect in a way that will demonstrate that they're negatively charged and therefore we'll know it's beta minus rather than gamma decay which would be undeflected in a cloud chamber okay so figure one shows an arrangement used by a student to investigate vibrations in a stretched nylon string a fixed length l he measures how the frequency of the first harmonic vibration of the string varies with the mass suspended from it and we've got some data here. So show that the data in table one are consistent with the relationship frequency is directly proportional to the square root of tension. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate frequency divided by root tension for each of the different sets of data. And we can see that it comes out as 50 in each case. And that would indicate that it is a directly proportional relationship between frequency and root tension. OK, so the nylon string has a density of 1,150 and a diameter of 5 times 10 to the minus 4. Determine the length of the string. And so we're going to use the um, equation F is 1 over 2L root T over mu. But first, we need to figure out what mu is. So um, the density is in kilograms per meter cubed. So if you multiply it by the cross-sectional area, that's going to have the unit of kilograms per meter or mass per unit length, which is what we want. And once we figure out what that is, we can just rearrange our equation to make L the subject, plonk our numbers in, and we end up with an L equal to 0.67 meters. Okay, so the student uses the relationship in question 2.1 to predict frequencies for tensions that are much larger than those used in the original experiment. Explain how the actual frequencies produced would be different from those that the student predicts. Well, at large tensions, the string is going to start to stretch and its diameter is going to start to decrease. So that's going to make the mass per unit length smaller, causing the frequency to get larger. OK, so moving on to question three, uh, we're going to look at some refraction and total internal refraction by the looks of it. So we've got a monochromatic green light instant normally on the curved surface. So the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. The refractive index of glass is 1.6. The refractive index of air is 1. 
calculate the angle of incidence. So we can just use Snell's law, um, but since air, which would be the material after the glass block, is what has a refractive index of one, sine r is one, we can then rearrange to make I the subject plug in the numbers, it comes out as 39 degrees. Okay, so instead of having air across the boundary, we now have a thin film of liquid, and the angle of incidence has changed, so we got again got the angular refraction 90 degrees, but the angle of incidence is now 58. Calculate the refractive index of the liquid. So this time n2 is not 1, so we're just going to leave it as n2. Make We've, it's already the subject, so we can just plug the numbers in and get N2 is 1.4. So the source of green light is changed to one that contains only red and blue light. Uh, for any material, red light has a lower refractive index than green light, and blue has a higher refractive index than green light. The angle of incidence remains the same. Describe and explain the path followed by the red and the blue rays immediately after the light is instant on the glass liquid interface. So the reason that red has a lower refractive index is red has a longer wavelength, which means it travels slightly faster. So having a lower refractive index is going to mean that red has a larger critical angle and blue has a smaller. So we'll start off looking at the blue. So if you have a higher refractive index, you have a smaller critical angle. And that's going to mean this angle of instance, 58, is now above the critical angle, and it's going to be totally internally reflected. And the opposite is going to happen to red. So lower refractive index means critical angle gets larger, so 58 is now below the critical angle, and it's going to just be refracted, bending towards the normal. Now, my answers were based on the idea that realistically that it's air on the other side where the refractive index will stay the same. Um, if it was liquid, we could argue actually we don't have enough information to answer this question. Um, but I, my answer is based on the air being the other side of the boundary. Okay. So question four, an engineer wants to use solar cells to provide energy for a filament lamp in a road sign. The engineer first investigates the EMF and internal resistance of a solar cell under typical operating conditions. The engineer determines how the potential difference across the solar cell varies with current. And we've got the results shown here. The engineer uses the graph to deduce that when in operating in typical conditions, a single solar cell produces an EMF of 0.7 volts and an internal resistance of 8 ohms. Explain how the engineer uses the graph to get the values for EMF and internal resistance. So uh, this is an experiment you should have done. So EMF is the y-intercept. The internal resistance is the gradient times minus 1. So to operate effectively, the lamp in the road sign needs a minimum current of 75 milliamps. Uh, the resistance of the filament amp is 6 ohms at that current. And we've got two possible circuits to make the power. So deduce using calculations where the circuits in figure 5 and figure 6 are suitable. So let's have a look at figure 5. So uh, and first of all, so figure 5 is pretty straightforward. We've got two resistors, the internal and the external, giving us a total resistance of 14. 0.7 divided by 14 gives us 50 milliamps, which is not enough. So the first circuit, figure five, is no good. Circuit two, uh, we have the parallel section and then the, another one in series, giving us a total EMF of 1.4. In parallel, they don't add together, remember, they just both have an EMF of 0.7. And then the internal resistance of the parallel power sources uh, will be added together using the parallel rule. That's in then in series with the third power source, giving the total internal resistance of the power source as 12. We can then add that to the external resistance. 1.4 divided by that gives us 78 milliamps, which is above the 75 required. So that is fine. OK, so solar cells convert solar energy to electrical energy with an efficiency of 4%. Sounds rubbish, but it's pretty standard. A solar cell supply used by the engineer has a total surface area of 32 centimetres squared. 
Calculate the minimum intensity in watts per meter squared of the sunlight needed to provide the minimum current of 75 milliamps when its resistance is 6 ohms. So, first of all, what we can do is we can work out the power needed by the resistor using the current and the resistance. That then represents 4% of the energy we need to be input. So if we divide that by 0 0.04, we need a total power of 0 0.84 watts from the solar cell. So intensity is power per unit area. We know the power. We need to convert the area into meter squared, giving us 2.6 times 10 to the 2 watts per meter squared of intensity. Okay. So moving on to question five, we've got um, a ladder propped up against a wall at 60 degrees to the ground. Uh, we've got a force at the top, the resultant force of the wall on the ladder shown acting horizontally, and we've got the weight force of the ladder shown as well. So explain how figure seven shows that the friction between the ladder and the wall is negligible. Well, friction always acts parallel to a contact surface but the resultant force is clearly perpendicular, which means there's no component of force parallel to the wall, which means there's no friction. So draw an arrow on the diagram to show the direction of the resultant force from the ground acting on the ladder. So uh, here's my arrow here. So there are gonna be two forces acting. There'll be a normal contact force upwards, and then there will be a frictional force acting to the right, giving us an arrow sort of pointing diagonally up to the right, which I really should have labeled G. So that's our other force. So the ladder is eight meters long and weighs 390 Newtons. Calculate the magnitude of the resultant force from the wall on the ladder. So I'm gonna use the principle of moments and I'm gonna take moments about the bottom of the ladder since I don't know the direction or the size of that force. So the weight force of the ladder acts halfway along its length, but we need to multiply that by cosine of 60 to make the distance perpendicular to the force. We're going to do a similar kind of thing with the force from the wall. We know it's going to act at, along the full length of the ladder, but again, we need to turn that into a perpendicular distance, which we can then rearrange and solve for F as like 112 newtons. So suggest changes to the forces acting on the ladder that occur when somebody climbs the ladder. So there'll be a few different ones. So thinking about it in terms of moments, as you climb the ladder, the weight force of the person would move to the right from the bottom of the ladder, which means the clockwise moment's going to increase. So that's going to mean the normal contact force at the top of the ladder is going to have to increase to me, make the moment stay the same. Um, so that's one thing that's going to change. Another thing would change, the reaction force from the ground would also have to increase upwards to make sure it's in equilibrium, and the frictional force would therefore increase as well. So there's a few different changes that we made. So moving on to question six, we've got a model of a system designed to move concrete building blocks from an upper level to a lower level. The model consists of two identical trolleys, mass capital M, on a ramp 35 degrees to the horizontal. The trolleys are connected by a wire that passes around a pulley of negligible mass at the top. So then we've got a side on profile like this. So the two blocks have a mass little m. They're loaded onto trolley A at the top of the ramp. The trolley is released and accelerates to the bottom of the ramp where it's stopped by a flexible buffer. The blocks are unloaded from A, and two blocks are loaded onto trolley B that is now at the top of the ramp. The trolleys are released, and the process is repeated. So essentially, each truck is going to pull the other one up as it goes down the ramp. Okay. So the tension in the wire when the trolleys are moving is T. Draw and label arrows on figure 9 to represent the magnitudes and directions of any forces and components of forces that act on trolley A, parallel to the ramp as it travels down. So, uh, first of all, it's going to have its component of weight force parallel to the ramp. So it's got its own mass plus the mass of the two blocks times sine 35. And it's going to have the tension force acting that way parallel to the slope. 
Okay, so assuming no friction acts on the axle of the pulley or the axles of the trolleys, show, and the air resistance is negligible, show the acceleration of the trolley B along the ramp is given by this expression. So the resultant force will be the component of weight force parallel to the slope from the heavier trolley minus the component of weight force parallel to the slope without the masses in it. So that will be the resultant force, which means the resultant force is just two little mg sine 35. Acceleration is force divided by mass. So the resultant force divided by the total mass of the system and the twos cancel out, giving you mg sine 35 over m plus m. Okay. Okay, so compare the momentum of loaded trolley A as it moves downwards with the momentum of loaded trolley B. Well, they have the same mass and they experience the same acceleration. So as they move the same distance, their velocities will be the same at every point, giving them exactly the same momentum. So in practice, for safety reasons, there is a friction break in the pulley that provides a resistive force to reduce the acceleration to 25% of the maximum possible acceleration. The distance is nine meters down the ramp. So now we've got the masses, calculate the time taken. So first of all, we can calculate the actual acceleration, which is the maximum over four, plug the numbers on, give us a acceleration of 0.337. We, the initial velocity is gonna be zero. So we can just use S equals half AG squared plug the numbers in, giving us 7.3 seconds. So it takes 12 seconds to remove the blocks at the lower trolley and reload. How many can we transfer in 30 minutes? Well, it takes 12 plus 7.3 seconds for one trip. So dividing the 30 minutes by that tells us we can take 93 trips, which means each trip can transfer two blocks, giving us 186 blocks. So a student is investigating forced vertical oscillations in springs. Two springs A and B are suspended from a horizontal metal rod that is attached to a vibration generator. The stiffness of A is K, the stiffness of B is 3K. Two equal masses are suspended from the springs as shown. Okay, so you can see it in there. So the vibrator and ge generator is connected to a signal generator the signal generator is used to vary the frequency of vibration of the metal rod. When the signal generator is set to two hertz, the mass attached to the spring A oscillates with a maximum amplitude, so it's in resonance, of 2.5 centimeters, and has a maximum kinetic energy of 54 millijoules. Okay, to use the spring constant for spring A and the mass M suspended from it. So I'm gonna get what K is first. So the maximum elastic potential energy must be equal to maximum kinetic energy. Elastic potential energy is maximized when it's at the amplitude. So we can plug our numbers in there and calculate our spring constant. Then because it's at maximum amplitude, we know that it's oscillating at its natural frequency. So since we know it's natural frequency two, we know it's spring constant now, we can figure out what its mass is, 1.1 kilograms. So calculate the frequency at which the mass attached to spring B oscillates with maximum amplitude. So we want the, essentially the natural frequency of B. So I'm just gonna use the fact that natural frequency and root K are directly proportional. So K is three times bigger. So the frequency should be multiplied by root three, giving us 3.5 Hertz. So then final question, we've got a diagram showing how the amplitude varies with frequency for spring A. Uh, the investigation is repeated with a mass attached to spring B immersed in a beaker of oil. The graph of the variation of amplitude with frequency is different. Explain two differences. So one difference is the peak is not going to be at two hertz, it's going to be at three hertz. The oil doesn't change what the natural frequency is, uh, so it's going to be at 3.5 still but the amplitude at all frequencies is going to be smaller as the drag force from oil will be much greater than air, so its damping is going to be increased. And that completes section A of this A-level paper one.